All right, welcome back, guys. Uh, this is Designing Interactive Data Dashboards. This is the advanced session. So those of you who joined us on Friday, we learned some of the basics. We reviewed the parks method, uh, pivot, analyze, rename, chart, and slice. Um, today, we're gonna, we're gonna kick things up a notch. Uh, we're gonna review some best practices in designing dashboards. Um, and then we're gonna dive right in and we're going to do some, some heavy lifting on how to really dig into your data and do some deeper analysis, make um, different types of engaging charts. And we're gonna do that through developing t-tests and putting all of that onto an interactive dashboard. And the tips and tricks that you're gonna learn through that process can be used in a wide variety of settings. All right. I'm gonna throw the link in the chat, Shelly. Um, if you haven't yet, uh, all of the materials and resources for today can be found on Shelly's website. If you go to Dashboard Workshops, there should be a drop down for the February uh, workshop where you can find the slides for today and you can find the um, Excel workbooks that we're going to be working in. So take a moment, go ahead and get those downloaded now. Um, also under the sample dashboards, uh, we've provided, I think there are nine dashboard examples up there that you can download. Uh, the, all of those dashboards are unlocked. So, so none of the pages are, are locked. You can dig around, you can see the inner workings of how Shelley designed those dashboards and use them as models as you are attempting to, to create your own dashboards for your own clients. All right, we're going to get started with, a, with an engaging activity here. Um, so here is an example of a dashboard. Um, it's not the best dashboard. It's not the worst dashboard I've ever seen. It's really close though. Um, but there are lots of problems with this dashboard. Um, and we're gonna take a few minutes here and, and kind of kick around uh, some ideas of why this is not the best dashboard. If I can get my computer to cooperate here. All right, here we go. All right, so there is a link to a Jamboard. And if you hop over to the Jamboard, there are two different pages. Um, second page is for all of our folks from Kansas State University who are joining us today. And the first page is for everybody else. So people from the Peace Corps, Arizona State University, HTA Consulting, the Goldstream Group, and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Um, and the general question is, is the lady there that's on the left-hand side of the screen here, she's looking at this dashboard and she's puzzled, she can't understand it. What are some of the things that make this dashboard so difficult to understand and interpret? Let me take what, like three to five minutes. I did not take you guys very long at all to pick up on some of these key ideas here. I love it. It was kind of summed up the best. Don't know where the focus should be on, right? So there's so much going on in this dashboard. You don't know what the key takeaway is. You don't know what the main message is. So the first thing when you're thinking about your dashboard is you should have just two to three messages that you're trying to convey and your users should be able to pick up on those within three to five seconds of when they take a look at your dashboard. And then there are all the other tiny things that help make that happen, right? So uh, the slicers, the buttons, they're up in the left-hand corner and they're really tiny. You can't even see all of the words there. They kind of just blend into the background. Um, the 3D pie chart smack in the middle. Is it necessary to have a 3D pie chart? I saw lots of comments about the colors, uh, this yellow and then the two shades of blue and then all of the various green, uh, oranges and browns. It doesn't seem to be a consistent theme to the colors and there's no meaning behind the different colors. So your color choices should have meaning and be planful. 
the various chart choices, um, not always the smartest chart choices. Um, this chart that's uh, below the pie chart here, uh, that divergent stacked bar chart is a really fancy, uh, sophisticated kind of chart to develop. But I don't know that that's the best way to convey the information that's being presented in that. Um, I saw people talking about the legends. Uh, there's lots of legends that are on this uh, dashboard, but most of them aren't very useful. What, what is a one? What is a 10? Having a, a more clear, consistent message would be helpful. And then, of course, the, the kicker. Uh, somebody talked about the picture. Uh, including graphics and images on your dashboard is kind of a, an advanced design technique. It really brings a human element to your dashboard. It provides some context. However, uh, you might have noticed through some of the data that you were reading that this project is about uh, increasing representation in STEM majors. And here we have a picture of four white men. Maybe not the best choice for images. But furthermore, on top of that, these gentlemen are looking away from the dashboard. It's like they're so embarrassed about the quality of this dashboard that they can't even look at it. Um, psychology does suggest that uh, as, as human beings, as social creatures, when we see somebody else looking at something, our eyes are drawn to look at that as well. And so maybe if the gentleman, if we put the image on the left-hand side, or maybe mirror the image, flipped it around so that the gentleman were looking towards the dashboard, it might be a little bit more appealing. Shelly, did you have anything to add? There are lots of other great responses on the Jamboard too. So flip back and forth between the two tabs and, and see what other people have thought. Well, I think we're ready to dive into kind of the three key design elements that separate the amateurs, quote unquote, from the professionals um, when it comes to designing an interactive dashboard. Um, and those three key design elements, I think a lot of you picked up on it. They have to do with color, charts, and labels. So first, let's talk color. So Tom and I have seen a lot of dashboards out there. Many, many workshop participants share their dashboards with us. And most of the dashboards that we see either utilize way too many colors or they're very black and white. They're boring. They're on a white background. So instead, um, well-designed dashboards tend to include no more than three or four colors. We've also noticed that well-designed dashboards are often placed on an interesting backdrop or a dark receding color. So these backgrounds really make the charts pop and kind of bring a sense of cohesiveness to the entire dashboard. Um, you'll also notice that these dashboards on the left only use colors that are derived directly from the client's logo. So when in doubt, you know, use your organizational colors or your client's colors to design your dashboards. Um, this will take a lot of the guesswork out of figuring out what colors you should use. Um, so in terms of color, there are kind of three general principles that we like to follow. First, I can't stress this enough, limit yourself to only three or four colors. Second is let your branding or your logo dictate the colors on your dashboard. And finally, be careful when it comes to bright colors like yellow, red, or orange. Um, bright colors are going to draw attention. Your eye is immediately going to go to the colors red, yellow, and orange. So as Tom mentioned, kind of use these colors strategically and sparingly in your dashboards. Now, what happens if your logo or your client's logo is bright red or only contains one color? The big question is, should you create a dashboard that's all red? Well, that's actually what happened to me in the past. Here's what my client's logo looked like. A nice monochromatic tree in crimson or maroon. So initially when I was New to this, I created a dashboard using the colors from this logo. But as you can see in the before image, um, my dashboard was rather jarring, right? It kind of felt like every chart was competing with one another. Nothing was really standing out. So here's my after. 
So in the after, I'm using a complementary color to this shade of red that I found online just by Googling, what's a complementary color to red or maroon? Um, I then use this teal color and light gray color as the central colors in my dashboard. So as you can see, kind of the red color is now just being used to emphasize certain elements of the dashboard. So for example, my clients were really interested to know about the perceived safety of the park. So I highlighted that particular variable in red. So I'm kind of just using the red to emphasize different parts of the dashboard and draw attention to things that my client is particularly interested in. So this is one way that you can work around a monochromatic or a red colored logo. Um, and there are several links to color wheels and color pal palette generators that I have up on my website for you to use. And I think Tom might have put in a couple of links as well in the chat box. All right, so that's color. Let's shift gears a bit and talk charts. All right, so in almost every presentation that Tom and I do, somebody asks us, hey, what kind of charts are best to use in an interactive dashboard? Which charts are most quote unquote effective? Um, well, there just so happens to be a kind of a growing body of research on this very topic. So user design specialists and data scientists have been researching what kind of charts are most eye-catching, which charts are easiest for people to re read and remember, um, and which charts to users interpret accurately. Um, so they've done a lot of eye tracking studies and user experience studies, and it turns out that there are three types of charts that are most effective in this respect. And by the way, a lot of this research is derived from the articles published in the journal called Information Visualization. So just out of curiosity, can you guess which charts are most effective? Take a guess in the chat. We'll see if you're right. Car pie, uh-huh. Any other guesses? A lot of bar charts, a lot of pie charts. All right, let's see if you're right. So the first chart that apparently our human eye likes to look at is the donut chart. So here are a couple of examples of donut charts from some of my sample dashboards. Um, as you can probably tell, I love donut charts. Um, users also like seeing donut charts in groups of three. So it turns out that we like seeing a repetition of numbers or charts that are clustered in threes. So when you're designing your dashboards, try to go for the donut chart and think about grouping similar charts together into threes or some variation of three. Um, and don't forget about the valuable real estate within your donut chart in that donut hole. Um, personally, I like to put a number or an icon in the middle of the donut chart to draw attention. Um, and later on today, Tom will show you how you can use the text box feature in Excel to create a dynamic number um, within your donut charts. So we'll practice doing that. Another type of chart that we like to look at according to studies is really any chart like a column chart with a goal line or a reference line. Right, so here are a few charts from my sample dashboards that feature that goal line. So the goal line apparently helps users derive the meaning behind the values. So it helps the user kind of interpret the findings. Um, interestingly enough, the so studies find that even an arbitrary reference line is going to help users make some sense out of your numbers. Um, Personally, I've also noticed that it helps me as the evaluator um, have kind of productive conversations with my clients. So I often point to a goal line or a reference line in a dashboard and ask my clients like, hey, what programmatic changes can we make to improve some of these averages that fall below the line? So I feel like these lines really help me in promoting kind of good formative conversations with clients. So the third chart is a line graph with slopes. 
All right, here are a couple of examples. So there's some research that suggests that our eyes are drawn to slopes and that even very, very young children can kind of intuitively grasp the meaning of slopes. So showing or displaying kind of pre-post data like this is probably going to win you some unconscious psychological points. And in a few minutes, Tom is actually going to show you how to create a dynamic slope chart in Excel. So your three, your three go-to charts are donut chart, the line graph with slopes, and any chart with a goal or a reference line. So just kind of keep those three charts in your back park pocket when designing your next dashboard. Okay, finally, before we open up Excel and work on our dashboards, let's talk a little bit about labels. All right. Now, when I first started dashboarding, I used to add headers to my dashboards that were very wordy. Um, they often included the entire survey question verbatim in the title. And I thought I was simply providing my clients with thorough information. Um, but then I learned about the three second rule of design of dashboard design. And I actually realized that I was doing a disservice to my clients. So the three second rule, I think Tom alluded to this, basically says that in three seconds or less, your user should be able to find, to locate the information that they're looking for in your dashboard. So now, as you can see from the after chart, I learned to create very simple parsimonious labels that get to the point in three seconds or less. Um, another thing that I just recently started doing that my clients tend to really like is I've been adding a question in the subheader of my title. Um, the reason why I started doing this is because I kind of noticed that my clients didn't know what to focus on in my dashboards. They were kind of overwhelmed by the amount of information, honestly. So simply by adding a question, I'm kind of helping the user essentially focus their attention on one particular thing per chart. So kind of consider adding a question in the subheader to kind of engage your users in a conversation or a dialogue with your dashboard. I found this to be super, super helpful. So if we put everything together and really think about the three second rule of dashboard design, hopefully we'll end up with more impactful charts and dashboards. So here's another before and after. This is kind of before learning about the three second rule, right? And this is after learning about the three second rule. Um, these two charts are actually, I don't know if you can tell, showcasing the same exact data. But the after is obviously created with some design principles in mind, right? And now you know what those design principles are, hopefully. So the take home message here is to prioritize clarity over clutter. All right. So now with those design elements in mind, I think we're ready to dive into Excel and create our t test dashboard. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. All right, everybody. So thank you, Shelly, for sharing your thoughts and, and tips on designing an interactive dashboard. Um, but we really want to kick your dashboards up to the next level. And the way to do that is to, to add some more tools to your toolbox, right? And so that's the that's the goal for the rest of this workshop here is we're gonna add a lot more tools to your toolbox. If you haven't yet had a chance, please go and download the, um, the practice data for today. But before we get too carried away, um, this is the finished product dashboard that is there. And I just wanted to take a moment and kind of share this and showcase this with you. This is the goal for today. We're not gonna get there. Um, we're gonna make a lot of progress, uh, but we're not gonna take as much time to go through and make all of these teeny tiny little um, adjustments. But uh, you can see that this is an interactive dashboard showcasing pre post data across four different questions. And you can kind of slice and dice through the data and see the different 
values reacting. Um, so this is the finished product. You have this. So um, after today's workshop is all done and you want to keep working on your dashboard, um, that's the goal. That's the dream. But here's what we've got to start out with. So this is the practice data t-test, right? Um, if you can, you probably want to have your dual screen going where you can be following along on one screen um, and have our presentation going on the other screen. All right, let's get started. Um, so when you open this up, you're going to notice that there's two tabs already available for you. There's the source data and then there's a pre-post comparison. Uh, the source data should look very familiar. This is the same data that we were working with on Friday. So we've got our ID number in the first column and then all of our different questions. Um, I did add a, another row at the top just to kind of give a little bit more meaning to these, just to help uh, you understand how the data is broken up. So these are the different uh, constructs. And so for our analysis today, we're going to be focused on these pre and post data that are in columns J through Q. Uh, the pre-post comparison tab, this is just kind of a, a starter place for our dashboard. Um, I just felt like I would just give you this, this blank template. So when we go to build our dashboard and we're making our, our end count and our slices and our charts, we already have some place that we can drop them. So this is our, our dashboard holder. All right, is everybody ready to get started? Okay, nobody's screaming and yelling, so let's get going. Um, on Friday, when you guys got started, Shelly mentioned the Parks method, so pivot, analyze, rename, chart, and slice. Uh, we're still going to be following a lot of those ideas today, but we're going to make a few tweaks along the way, and then hopefully um, I'm going to show you a few other shortcuts and tips and tricks, right? So we're just giving you more tools in your tool belt, right? Um, and the first one is when you go to select your data. On Friday, a lot of you probably went to cell A1, which was the ID number, and you did insert pivot table. That's not going to work today because we have this extra row at the top. And so I want to make sure that when I'm highlighting my data to create a pivot table, that I'm only highlighting the data. I don't want both rows at the top where Excel is going to give me all kinds of conniption fits and errors. All right, so if I start here in cell A2 and I hold down Control, Shift, and hit the right key, that's going to highlight the first row. So that's my shortcut, Control, Shift, right. And then I'm going to hit Control, Shift, down, and that's going to highlight all the way down to row 585. And so now I have all of my responses highlighted. This is the entire data table. And now I can go up to Insert pivot table. I can click insert. And just to double check, I got A2 to V585. and I'm going to a new worksheet and hit OK. While we're here, I'm just going to rename my sheet. This is going to be my pivots. All right, so for our first uh, pivot, analyze, rename chart and slice, um, the first thing I do when I start building an interactive dashboard is I build a chart for my end count. Um, I have found that that just saves me a lot of time in building out my whole dashboard. And so the first thing I do is I do my end count. And so our first pivot table here, we're just gonna grab ID number, and drop that into the values. Now, if you recall, ID number was a number. And so Excel is defaulting to summing those ID numbers, which doesn't make any sense for us. Uh, we want this to be our end count. And so part of our analyze here, we're just going to change it from a sum to a count. And all I did was I went up to my pivot table, I right clicked, I went down to summarize values by, 
and I went to cat. And I changed it to a cat. Now, we might end up with, I don't know, 30, 40 pivot tables on this one sheet. And so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rename. So this is my end count. And all I did was from my pivot table, I went up to the pivot table analyze menu. And under the pivot table name, I just typed in end count to rename my pivot table. All right, so we have pivoted, we've analyzed, we've renamed. Now we're going to chart. Um, sort of. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a dynamic end count for our interactive dashboard. And I want to use a text box to do that. OK, so these steps might seem a little out of order, but just, just bear with me and follow along and I'll explain the reason behind all of these steps as we go through. So the first thing is I want you to go to one of the cells next to your pivot table. I just go directly to the right. So I'm in cell B4. I'm gonna type equals and then click my 583 that's in my cell. And so I have a cell next to my pivot table that's saying the same thing my pivot table does. Now I'm going to hop over to my dashboard. Once I'm on my dashboard, I'm going to insert a text box. So just go up to the insert menu. I can grab my text box here. Um, some versions of Excel, if you look under shapes, you'll see a text box under shapes. So I'm just going to insert a text box. And I've got my cursor there, but I'm not going to type anything into my text box yet. Just want to create a text box. Grab it so that you can move it around so that the cursor's not in the text box. So grab it and move it around. And then put your cursor in the formula bar while you have selected the text box. Type equals in the formula bar. And then click on your pivots and select the cell that we just referenced. So B4. You should see a formula that will pop up that looks like this. Equals pivots exclamation point B4 and then hit enter. And now you should see in your text box, it popped up the number 583. I'm just gonna increase the font so that we can see that. All right, do you need me to walk you through that process from the beginning one more time? Uh, yes. Awesome, great. So I'm just gonna delete that. I'm going to delete this. Are you? Can we start with the pivot table? All right. So here's the steps. I have my pivot table that has my end count in it. Next to the pivot table, I typed equals and selected the cell in my pivot table. It comes up with this long formula equals get pivot data and then a bunch of references to information about my pivot table and I hit enter. And so I see in my cell B4, B4, that it's got the same number as my pivot table. Then I go back to my dashboard, I'm gonna insert a text box. And I can grab my text box here, just draw a text box. Grab your text box and move it around. And what that does is it takes the cursor and out of the text box and makes it available to put it in the formula bar, All right? So once you've moved your text box around, put your cursor in the formula bar, type equals, go back to your pivot sheet 
and click that reference cell we just created. So B4. We should see a formula pops up equals pivots, exclamation point, B4. Hit enter. We should see that number 583 pop up in your text box. I'm going to make the font bigger so everybody can see. Now, this is where you could take some time and you could play around, you know, with the size, with the um, coloring. We can type N equals into the text box. Um, and we could put this anywhere on our dashboard now. And we don't have to worry about the sizing of the cells or anything like that. All right. Now, we want this to be a dynamic end count. And so thinking about the parts method, we pivoted, we analyzed, we charted, we created our dynamic end, we created our end count chart, and now we're going to slice. And so I'm going to go back to the My Pivots tab, click on My Pivot Table, clicked on cell A4, and now I'm going to insert my slicers, just like we did Friday. So go to the Pivot Table Analyze menu, insert slicer. You see a dialog pops up with all of our column headers. And I'm going to pick out major, gender, and race. Click OK. We've got my three slicers. Just resize these a little bit. Now, normally, uh, Shelly and I strongly encourage that you cut and paste your slicers, but just for today's purposes, just because we're going to be trying to understand how things are working, I am going to copy and paste my slicers to the dashboard. Um, if things start to get wonky, though, that's because you've got two copies of your slicers going on, and you're going to want to delete the copy that's on your pivots sheet. But for now, I'm going to copy, so control C. Go back to my dashboard and paste, control V. So here's my slicers. And now I can click through and see that my end count is changing based off of my slicers because the slicer is editing my pivot table and my end count is pulling from that pivot table. All right, that's a pretty good start. Next steps, how did you add in? Okay, so um, if you have your text box, you can just click in your text box. You might have to double click, but you'll notice that you can't edit the number, but you can type before and after the number. Great question, Matthew, thank you. All right. Next step, we're gonna go back to our pivot sheet and we're gonna work on our next set of analyses. So back on my pivot sheet, I'm gonna copy my pivot chart or my pivot table. And if you recall from Friday, the reason we're gonna copy and paste our pivots is so they stay connected to the slicers. So when I copy and paste this pivot table, it's gonna be connected to my same three slicers. I'm gonna hop over here to cell K1 and paste my pivot table there. And so all I've done so far is I copied my pivot table and I pasted it in cell K1. Now this next step, this is the game changer. This was the step that when we figured out 
that this works. This is what made all the magic happen. Take your ID number that you have placed in values is doing a count now and drop it into rows. I see several questions popping up about the text boxes. We'll come back to those. Sorry, can you repeat the last step you just did really fast? Yep. So all I did was after I pasted my pivot table, after I pasted my pivot table in cell K1, I went over to the values where I had count and I put it on rows. So now I have all of my different student IDs are listed out in the rows of my pivot table. Can I just ask um, why you took it from the values box? I mean, couldn't you take it from up above from the you list? Could. Either way works the same. Yeah, I just don't need necessarily need it in the values for what we're doing next. Uh -huh. And since it's already there, instead of throwing it out, instead of pulling it down to the rows and then throwing it out of the values, it just pulled it from values over to rows. You're recycling. One, one, one less click. Thanks. All right. To finish building out this pivot table, I want you to scroll through your fields list and you should see those pre post questions. So it starts with use statistics to analyze data, work in a group, give a presentation, write scientific reports or papers, and then the same things for our post, but they have a two after them. So use statistics to analyze data two work in a group to give a presentation to and write scientific reports or papers to. And so those are our pre post test data, those eight columns there. And we're going to drop these all eight of them into the values, but we're going to drop them in pre post order. And so we're going to take the use statistics and put that in values first. And then use statistics two next so that it goes pre post. And we're going to follow that pattern. So work in a group, work in a group two, give a presentation, give a presentation two, and then write scientific reports or papers, and write scientific reports or papers too. And I'm being very specific and careful to keep dropping those at the bottom of the list here. If you scroll across your pivot table, you should see that they go in that correct order. So it goes the pre and then the post. And you know it's the post because it has a two at the end. Pre post, pre post, pre post. In a couple, in a minute or two here, we're going to hop over to breakout rooms give everybody a chance to, to get caught up and work together to answer questions. Uh, hopefully, uh, Valkyria and Adrian will be able to figure out what's going on with your text boxes and help you out there. Before we jump over to breakout rooms, does anybody have questions that maybe the whole group needs to hear? All right, I'm going to pop over to breakout rooms.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope that that was a pretty straightforward process. Uh, we've been easing you into this today. Uh, does anybody still have any lingering questions or is everybody caught up? All right, I'm seeing a couple of head nods. So we're gonna press right on forward. Okay, so now that we have this pivot table over here and we have our slicers, if you click the slicers, you may notice that the ID numbers are changing. It's hard to tell that these slicers are connected to it, but you can see a little bit of the data going on there. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to construct a, another data table outside of our pivot table that's going to do some calculations based on the data in our pivot table. I'm gonna say that again one more time. We're gonna construct a data table outside of, a, outside of our pivot table that's gonna do a bunch of calculations on the data that's within our pivot table. All right, so, um, Normally this kind of small details would matter, but since we're trying to follow along and copy everybody carefully, um, follow along and copy carefully. So we're gonna start in cell A15. And I'm gonna make a list of the different things that we're gonna calculate. So first we're gonna calculate an average, and then we're gonna calculate a standard deviation. And then we're gonna calculate a count, like an end count. So average, standard deviation, and count. And then we're going to do our t-test. Since we're putting this on an interactive dashboard, t-tests are spit out. Uh, they spit out a p-value that's in scientific notation. Um, I don't know about your clients, but not all of my clients like scientific notation. So we're going to uh, look at those p-values and dis display them uh, in not scientific notation. Then we're going to be very explicit and tell our clients if that's significant or not. Um, some of our clients are a little stat savvy, um, and Shelly and I have also found that there are multiple ways of interpreting data. And so in addition to a t-test, we're going to calculate a Cohen's D. It's another statistical process for looking at the difference between two groups. And we're gonna use that Cohen's D to determine an effect size. So we're gonna do an average, a standard deviation, a count, a t-test, p-value. Is that significant? Cohen's D and effect size. You may recall that we have pre-post data for four different items. And so I'm just gonna do pre-post four times. And then our first one is stats. Our second one is, uh, what is it, group work. If I skim over here, I can see stats, group work, presenting, and then writing reports. And so these are labels for me. Um, my clients aren't gonna see this data table, so I can put whatever I want here. This is just to help me keep my calculations organized. All right. Like I said, we're just constructing a table here. We're gonna write a bunch of formulas in a moment. And this is just laying, laying out the columns and rows of our data table here. Are we good? Okay. All right. So our formula, our first formula, I'm clicked here in cell B15. I'm just going to type equals average, open parentheses. And then I'm going to click column L. Uh, 
as I did was I typed equals average and then clicked column L. I'm gonna hit enter. I see an average of 7.5. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. An average of 7.5. If I recall, these were Likert style items that ranged one to five. How are we getting an average that's greater than five? We might have an issue somewhere. I know exactly where it is. If you hop to the bottom of your pivot table, so I've clicked over here in my pivot table in the uh, column ID. You can scroll all the way down, but I'm lazy. And so I'm going to hit that control down and it's going to jump to the bottom. And I see at the bottom of my pivot table, there's this grand total row. That's being calculated into my average. I don't want this grand total calculated in my average, 2,189, that's nobody's response. So we need to get rid of this grand total row. And the, way, the easiest way to do that is click that cell that says grand total, right click to pull up the menu, and then remove grand total. One more time. Click the cell that says grand total, right click to pull up the menu, and then click to remove grand total. Now, if I go back up to my data, I can see, oh, 3.7. That looks so much more reasonable. All right. Now we can continue. So I'm back in cell B16, and we're going to put in a standard deviation. So equals STDEV. Um, you're going to have to take a stats course to figure out which standard deviation you want to use. For today, I'm just going to use STDEV, but um, we could hop on another call at some point and talk about the pros and cons of the different ones. All right, and then click column L. So my formula is equals STDEV, open parentheses, L colon L, and then hit enter. And I got a value of 1.34. Uh, if your values are not matching exactly mine, you might wanna check that your slicers are cleared. Um, because you may notice is if you click through the slicers that the values are changing. And so make sure to clear all your slicers if you're double checking that your values are matching mine. All right, next formula is count equals count, C-O-U-N-T, open parentheses, and click column L. and hit enter. All right, so we have an average, a standard deviation, and a count. I'm very lazy, if you haven't noticed already. And so instead of typing that formula out eight more times, I'm gonna highlight these three cells. I'm gonna take my cursor down to the right-hand corner, and it's gonna turn into this plus symbol. When it's that plus symbol, I can just drag this across. So left click and drag. And that's going to populate my formulas across. And I can see equals average for L, for M, for N, O, P, Q, R, and S. Again, all I did was I highlighted my three cells cursor down to the bottom right corner, and it turns into this plus symbol. Left click, drag all the way across. These decimal points drive me nuts. Shrink the decimal points. I just highlighted all those cells. And up in the top, I'm on the home ribbon underneath number. 
you can increase and decrease the decimal. All right. Having given this workshop several times in the past, we've learned some of our errors and mistakes, and I apologize for the sirens in the background. Um, for the rest of these formulas, I've already given them to you. So if you go down to your uh, tabs and right click and unhide, you should see a sheet that's called pivot dash two. Go ahead and unhide pivot dash two. And you should see these five formulas. So un go down to your sheets, right click and unhide, unhide pivot dash two, and you should see these five formulas. We're gonna copy those formulas and paste them in our pivots sheet. So I just highlighted all five, did control C to copy. And I'm gonna go back to my pivots. And in this cell right here, C18 under the post, I'm gonna paste. So I pasted those in cell C18. So I've got all five lined up, my t-test, my p-value, is it significant, the Cohen's D, and my effect size, but they're under the post column. All right, so right now, Excel is not actually running these calculations. If you click on the cell here, C18, that's trying to do our t-test. It just has the formula spelled out there. It's not actually calculating the formula. If you look up in the formula bar, you'll notice there's an apostrophe in front of the equal sign. If you delete that apostrophe, that makes the formula active and Excel will try to calculate it. Now I'm gonna talk you through what's going on in this formula, all right? So you have the formula, you don't need to type it, but we're gonna build it out from scratch so that you can follow along and understand what's happening. So first, t-test. When I do my t-test, it's looking for two arrays, pre and post. And so my first array is column L and my second array is column M. Then it's asking for tails and you could do a one-tailed or a two-tailed. Since this is pre-post data, I opted to do a one tail because we are expecting the post data to have a higher average value than the pre-data. And so we did a one tail. But more importantly is the type. So for Excel, there are three types of t-tests. There's a paired sample t-test, which that's the case here. We have matched pre to post data. And you can see that in our pivot table, each row is one student and there's their pre-data and then there's their post data. And so we have paired. But if it wasn't paired, you could do two sample equal variance. If it wasn't necessarily um, a pre-post, right? Maybe it was a, a participant group and a comparison group, you might do a two sample equal variance but we don't have that, we have matched, which is the best option. So that's the t-test formula. Now I'm gonna hit enter and I see my significance. However, we've learned so many things from building these dashboards. They have a secret trick here for you. If I come up here and I hit my slicers and I do mail for chemistry, for non-underrepresented minorities. Oh, wrong question. Let me just put this over here for a second. T-test for group work isn't going to work. It pops out an error. And if you are building a dashboard and you have errors that can cause problems, not only for your charts, but for your text boxes and everything else. And so I've gotten in the habit of wrapping my formulas in an if 
error statement. And so I do if error, open parentheses, and then I've got my t-test formula. And then if there is an error, spit out blank, nothing. And so now I can see that for chemistry mail, not underrepresented, I'm not getting my error, I'm getting a blank. But if it was somebody else, I'm seeing that value. So that's the if error, okay? So that's my t-test formula. For the p-value, when I activate that, all this is doing is looking at my t-test p-value number that was spit out. And if it's less than 0 0.01, put the text less than 0 0.001. Otherwise, give me the p-value. All that's doing is displaying not scientific notation. And so this is in scientific notation. And so I'm going to get less than 0 0.001. If I click around, maybe find a value, right? So this is not less than 0 0.001. So I'm just getting the p-value. So that's all that formula is doing there. And then my significance formula is just looking at that t-test p-value again. And if it's less than 0 0.05, put out the text significant. If it's not less than 0 0.05, put out the text not significant. This is less than 0 0.001, so it's going to spit out significant. And let's see if we can't find something that's not significant. There's something not significant. Computer science, females, underrepresented minorities, not significant. My Cohen's D formula, when I activate that, it's looking at the average and the standard deviation of both groups and calculating an effect size. And so it's the difference of the two averages divided by the root mean square of their standard deviations. And that's what all this mess in the middle is here, is the formula for Cohen's D. The difference between the two averages divided by the root mean square of their standard deviations. And then again, wrapped in that if error statement, so that if there's an error, I don't know, for example, the two averages are the same, No, that's great, Shelly, magnitude size. Um, so it's going to spit out a decimal point, most likely. And then the effect size is going to look at that Cohen's D and interpret it. So you can look at the way that it's interpreting it. So if my Cohen's D is less than 0.2, that's negligible. If it's less than 0.5, that's small. If it's less than 0.8, that's medium. Less than 1.4 is large. Anything more than 1.4 is very large. And so there's my five formulas. Now that I've activated them, I'm going to copy all five and go and paste those under the post for each of my questions. I just copied my five formulas and pasted them under post for each of my constructs. And then you can click around with your slicers and see that all of those formulas are changing. And again, that error popped up for chemistry, male, non-underrepresented minorities. And so we see no t-test, no Cohen's d, because their averages were the same. All right, that was a lot to follow along with.
any broad questions or we're going to hop over to breakout rooms and make sure that everybody's caught up before we go on to taking this data table and making some charts to put on our dashboard. All right, we'll send you to breakout rooms. See you back in 10 minutes. Hey, right. welcome back, everybody. Seemed like everybody is pretty well caught up. We got all of their t tests and Cohen's D significance and effect size all calculated. I think we're ready to start building out our dashboard now. All right, can you see my screen and cursor okay? Yeah. All right. Um, one thing that popped up in one of the breakout rooms I was in, people were wondering about the values that are in the cells. I just had my decimal points smaller, a fewer decimal points. And so maybe your values look slightly different than mine. Uh, you can adjust the value, the number of decimal points. But I did the same thing here again. That's just up here at the number, right? Um, and then Shelly mentioned that uh, some people were wondering, why did we do this extra step to make text box and use this cell outside? Why didn't we just, in our dashboard, we could have just as easily picked a cell here, typed equals here, and referenced our count here and had, and then I can play around with the stuff that's here in this cell. Um, my answer to that is once I have my text box, it's easy to put my text box wherever I want and resize it and reshape it, um, change the font and everything else. Uh, with this cell here, I find that you're kind of limited to the size of your columns. And if you start having a bunch of charts on your dashboard and you start playing with the width and the height of your columns to make your end look good, it starts changing the height and width of your charts. And that just annoys me. And so um, I do the text box. Um, but yes, you can put it in the formula in, in the side there. And that works just as well. Um, also, I wanted to show you how to do that technique in case that's something that would be useful to you. And we're going to do that same thing with our um, stats that are down here to put those on our dashboard. All right. Um, so first, though, uh, we're going to start building some charts, right? So if I go way back to thinking about the parks method, we did pivot, we did analyze, we analyzed a lot right? And then one pivot chart and then all of this analysis. I should, probably should rename this chart. Um, and so I'm going to call this uh, T table for my T test, just to be consistent with our acronym, pivot, analyze, rename. Now we're going to chart. All right. In order to chart, I want to do a slope line for my pre-post, just like you saw in uh, our presentation earlier in today's presentation. Shelly was talking about slope lines are a great way to show pre-post data. And so if I highlight pre-post and highlight my two values, I can insert a chart. And Excel defaults to trying to do a bar chart. And we know that that's not great. And so I'm going to go over to all charts and go down to line and get my little slope line. Great. So there's my sloped line. Now there are lots of ways of making this better, uh, prettying up this chart. Um, one for sure that I wanna do is to fix my Y axis. Um, if you were here on Friday, one of the things that we know about interactive dashboards is that as you hit the slicers and the values change, your y-axis is going to change. And that can lead to confusion and misinterpretation. And so one thing to do is to fix the y-axis. And so all I did was double click on the y-axis 
and typed in the values one and five. Um, I also am a huge fan of adding data labels. And there are lots of ways of playing around with the data labels to make this prettier. Uh, just for grins and giggles, uh, I'm going to go back to my marker and put in a circle marker. So I just clicked my line, put the little paint can, pulled up the marker built-in circle. I'm gonna make this a pretty big circle. Actually, I want both of them to be pretty big. And then for my marker, I'm gonna come down to the fill color and make that really light. And then I'm going to drop my data labels to be in the center. Get rid of the grid lines. Um, I have found that deleting the y axis causes me issues down the road. And so instead of deleting the y axis, I just change the font to match my background. All right, this pretty clear, simple chart. I'm going to size it down a little bit because we're going to have four of these. And based off of your own style preferences, your clients' preferences, or your organization's preferences, you might have different ways that you like to do slope line charts. Um, I think the key is to be consistent and to be simple. But once you've got your line chart, you're pretty satisfied with it. And take a minute to actually play around with some of the features we're going to make copies of this for our other three. Can you say again how you got to markers? I cannot find it. So if you click the line. Okay. And then go to the paint can. Mm -hmm. Marker. See line and marker. Click marker. Uh -huh. And then I did the drop down the marker options built mm -hmm. in, and I picked the circle. Mm -hmm. And then I just made it really big. Actually, it's probably too big. Like 26? 18, maybe, I don't know. Depends on how big your numbers are. And then how did you put the labels in there? Um, so I did the plus sign here to add data labels. And then once I had the data labels, you can put them in the center. Thank you. Okay, so once you're satisfied with your chart, you're gonna to wanna to copy your chart and make Four more versions of it. Two. Two. Make sure to click off your chart before you paste. Three. And four. So now I have four copies of my chart. First one we're going to leave alone. But the second one. I'm just going to slide this over. Change the title. Group work. And then my data labels, 
data labels, uh, I need to move back to the center. But it retained most of the rest of my formatting. The size of the chart, the size of my markers, the fill, the color. All right, you get two more chances to see that. So grab my third one. All I'm doing is taking the blue and purple box, sliding it over. Change the title. Put my markers back in the center and data labels back in the center. And one more. Slide this over. Put my data labels back in the center. Okay. So I've got all four charts and they're lined up with their corresponding pre-post results. And I take my four charts and I'm gonna cut and paste them. So I just selected all of them by holding down the control key. I'm gonna cut them, control X go over to my dashboard and paste them. And spread these out a little bit. Well, I'm zoomed out pretty far, I don't know why. And all the changes that we made to pretty them up, we can also make them over here, right? You sure can. Um, in order to keep the consistency, I like to make one and get it to where I think is the final version, or as close to the final version as I can, I can, and then make copies of it because that just saves me time on the back end of editing four different charts instead of just editing one chart. But yeah, if you want to like have alternating colors, you could do blue, orange, blue, orange, teal, orange, teal, orange. Okay, uh, just to double check, my slicers are working. You see the values changing, you see the slope changing, my end count is changing. This is coming along, interactive dashboard. All right. Now, we did all the work to do those statistics. It's going to be nice to include some of that in our dashboard. And again, there are two ways to do that. Uh, and I've shown both of, you, both of them to you already today. One is to do include text boxes. So we could put in a bunch of text boxes that call back to the cells that are on our pivot table. The other is to just edit the cells that are in our dashboard with calls to those values in our pivot table or in our dash in our pivots tab. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do both of them here just so that you can see both of those um, for the use stats. Um, down below here, I'm just going to type in equals, go back to my pivot sheet, and click my p value. And then do that again, type equals, go back to my pivot sheet, and click my significance. I can do that again, equals, go back to my pivots, pick up my colons D, and then equals and pick up my effect size. That wouldn't didn't take, why did that one not take? Oh, 
This is my P value. This is significant. So oh, it's D and that size. And so here you can kind of see what I was talking about, you know, with the cell sizes and the size of the fonts and the text that you might have to play around with the size of your columns. So that's the downside to doing it this way. It, like right now, I feel like I need to change my column size and that changed my chart size, right? But the upside to that is that now I could do some conditional formatting. Uh, for example, on this cell that says significant, I can insert some conditional formatting. So highlight cells, and then I'm gonna do text that contains, and I'm gonna type in an exclamation point. And so if it's significant and has that exclamation point, it's going to highlight that cell. If it's not significant, It's grayed out. And you can do different types of colors for your conditional formatting. And you can conditional format the effect size. So if it was medium, if it was large, if it was very large, you would just have to add three different conditional formatting statements. You could even highlight the p-value in some conditional formatting, highlight cell rules less than. 1.05. Maybe even add a statement, highlight cell rules, um, text that contains less than symbol. So that's one way is to put the formulas directly into the cells but then you have to play around with the size of your columns and your rows. And you could do all kinds of different formatting here, put in a box, uh, change the background color to make it stand out. Uh, the other way though is this text box stuff. So um, I can insert a text box, just draw a text box move it around so the cursor is not in the text box, but put my cursor in the formula bar, and then go back to my pivots tab to reference those different cells. And so the first one, I'm gonna grab my, um, I'm on the second run. So I'm gonna grab group work, t-test, p-value. That's not the right cell. I want the p-value of that one. And I can play around with the font here. I can move it around, put it wherever I want. I can copy and paste this. So four different versions to grab my four different cells. So those cells were lined up one, two, three, four, right and right below each other. And so I can just edit this formula. Instead of 19, I can grab 20. 21 and 22. And so the upside to using the text boxes is it's easier to move them around, to put them wherever you want on the dashboard, to change the font size, to change the, the wrapping of the text without messing up your chart. The downside is, is it's a little bit harder to get that conditional formatting to work. With these cells here, I could just conditionally format these cells and my text boxes would automatically populate. 
There is a way to do that conditional formatting, but it's a little bit more tricky. If we get some time at the end, maybe we'll come back and take a look at that. Um, but from here, I would put in um, maybe some more text boxes to line these up. But as you probably saw on this dashboard here, I did the text boxes, just the effect size and the very small. And these are actually grouped. And so you can see the formulas that are up there. But that's one way to do it. There's lots of ways. All right, questions, curiosities. Is everybody busy making their own pretty dashboard? All right, so we have about 10 minutes left. If you have questions at all related to interactive dashboards in Excel, please fire away. I think my biggest question was um, the qualitative responses. I know that you did some dashboards with that. Um, if you had any tips on that one. You want to field that one, Shelly? Um, so let's see. So on my website, I have three sample qualitative dashboards um, that you can take a look at. Um, these qualitative dashboards looked at an open-ended question on a survey. Um, so you can kind of see how I organized the data. Um, let me put it in. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, so if you scroll all the way down, um, you'll see qualitative dashboard, qualitative dashboard two, qualitative dashboard three. Feel free to download those. And then you can kind of see what's behind, you know, how the sausage was made. Um, if you just right click and unhide all the pivots, then you can kind of see what went into that. Um, the key with qualitative dashboards is you have to code your data before creating a dashboard. Um, and what I mean, I hope you guys know what I mean by coding your, your data, um, come up with different themes of how to group your data and then code it zero or one. That's kind of the key. Um, let me see if I could download one really quickly so I can show you what that looks like. Let me share my screen. Chili, we've used it in vivo to um, process our, our um, testimonial data. Do you use a program like in vivo or? How do you code it? So this is how, this is the data that's feeding into this dashboard. So again, this is an interactive dashboard. And let me zoom in here so you could see. So here are the themes that emerge. So this dashboard is basically answering the question, briefly describe what you liked best about the workshop. And my client wanted to know how did females respond? How did males respond? How did non-URM students respond? How did URM students respond? You kind of see that there are huge differences um, between the genders and the different race and ethnicity groups. 
this is how I organized my data. So each row is a student. I know their race, ethnicity category, their gender. Here's their quote. So this student said, the packets were really cool and useful. So that's why I put a one under resources because they're basically kind of talking about resources, right? And I put a zero under the other categories. So I first kind of read through all of the quotes and I was like, okay, people are talking about meeting people, resources, instructor, guided walk. And then you can see that I just put ones and zeros to code the data. I think you can do this in, in vivo, but I am I love Excel. So I just kind of use Excel for almost everything. Um, you'll notice, let's see, that some quotes like this one, row 20, um, this particular student said, all of the material and getting to meet my work partner. So that's why I put a one under meeting people and a one under resources. So some students said more than one category. And I just kind of make a note of that in the dashboard. So I put a little note. This is just a text box that you can move around. So I just kind of said, this is the percentage of students who mentioned this theme in their response. Note percentages may not up to may not add up to 100% of students mentioned more than one theme. So because a lot of my clients were just like, why doesn't this add up to 100%? So that's why I kind of made that note. So you can see, for example, with males, 33% said something related to meeting people. And here's what they actually said. 67% love the instructor. And here's what they said. And then if you look in the pivots, this is kind of how I've set up the data. Again, these are just all pivot tables. Notice I'm referencing numbers outside of the pivot tables, right? Because I'm using a lot of text boxes. So that's why you see a lot of referenced numbers. That's basically the setup of this one. And then the setup of the other two are a little bit different, but it's kind of the same um, methodology. Um, I think this is how I've set up almost all of the qualitative uh, data that feeds into the dashboard. Shelly, we have another question in the chat. Um, and you you can field this one if you want to, or I can. Um, on the dashboard that I was showing for the t-tests, um, I have some text boxes that are dynamically changing to, to say what my slicers are slicing on. How did we do that? Do you want me to take that one or you want to? Okay. Go for it. <laughs> All right. So this is a, this is what the question is about is um, here's the finished, finished, are they ever really finished? No, the finished dashboard. Um, and then on the left-hand side here, I have some text boxes that are displaying uh, when I hit my slicer, they're displaying what slicer selection. Um, I do that on some of my dashboards when the clients have expressed that they might be printing my dashboards. Um, and so usually the way they print, uh, I select a print layout that doesn't include the slicers. And so I started adding these so that they know which category is being sliced on. Okay, so that's why those are here. Now, how to do that is a whole nother thing, right? Um, you should have a copy of this if you wanna follow, or you can just follow along. But if I unhide my pivot dash, you're gonna see all the pivot tables that are going into these. Is this the right one? This doesn't look like the right one. This is the other one. Let's actually, hold on, give me one second. It's been a long time. Pivot dash two. So this is pulling from pivot dash two. So unhide pivot dash two. Yep, there we go. So you're going to see up here, here's my count pivot table that we did earlier. But I added the filters to the top. And then off to the side of my filters, I have a reference cell for the filter. So let me go um, steal the slicers back over here so you can see how that works. Okay. 
And so all the slicers are doing is they're acting like filters. And so on my pivot table, if I throw the same fields that my slicers are on into the filters and don't actually filter anything, when I hit my slicer, it adjusts the filter to match. And then I can have a reference cell next to it so I can use a text box to call that value. Did that help, Rachel? Yes, thank you. Awesome. In the qualitative dashboard that we were looking at a second ago, where the slicers are on this thing that looks like a remote control, I really like that. I think it's very user friendly, you know, by putting the slicers into something else that people are sort of metaphorically familiar with. They might be more comfortable using it. Yeah, so. I like to put all of my slicers into a little box and then put like the, the dynamic end count at the bottom because some of my clients are just like, I don't know where to click. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I like to group them all together, put a little box around them and then say at the top, like select any of these filter buttons. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes you even have to put specific directions on how to use the filters, just like in a little text box, right? So click the buttons to slice and dice, click the red X to clear the filters, click the three check marks to multi-select. I've had to do that for some clients because they just can't remember how to use the filters. Do you have a sample dashboard with those instructions on it? I don't have any sample dashboards posted anywhere. Um, in On my website, if you go to classic dashboard, the first sample dashboard, um, and if you download that, I have an introduction page or sheet. And sometimes I include instructions in that introduction sheet. And I think I did that for the classic dashboard. So you can kind of see how I instructed people on how to use the dashboard. Great. So I think you had said that Tom was going to show us how you put pictures in donuts or something. Oh, the percents in the middle of the donuts? Yeah. So you do it the same way we did our end count. Just a text box and then. Yep. So you have a pivot, you have your pivot table that you're pulling your donut chart from. Do a reference cell next to your pivot table for the value that you want in the middle. And then on your dashboard, put a text box calls to that value and just drop it in the middle of your donut. Hmm. Cool. Would you like to see that specifically? Sure. Okay. All right, so this is back to the t-test. I think this is the finished, finished note. This is the one we were working on earlier. And so I'm gonna just come over here, steal my pivot table and make a little donut chart real quick. Um, what was a good one? I can accomplish my degree in four years or less. That's a great one. Fantastic. Change this to a uh, percent of the column total, a percent of grant total. And then I'm going to put my reference cells off to the side. So no. Yes. Percents. Percents. Insert chart, donut chart, great. 
I can put this on my dashboard. There it is. And then if I want this value, my yes, on my dashboard, I just insert a text box. Grab my text box in the formula bar, type equals, and go back to my reference cell. Grab my value. There it is. I can bump up the font size, uh, make the fill, no fill, outline, no outline. Can even center it. Drop that in the middle there. And where's my slices? Oh, there we go. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right.